put it at the bottom because it was over something I wanted to show. So, okay, can you everybody see that? Yep. Yes. Okay, this is going to be an introduction to printing. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of different material, but I'm just going to touch on a most on most of it. At the end, and, and, and later on, probably tomorrow, I will be sending out a list of my reference materials. And there is one reference material in particular that's free. It's a 156-page PDF of fine art printing. And it's excellent. And it's free. And uh, so, but a lot of this stuff can get really technical. You can... You can lose yourself. You can go down the rabbit hole in this after a while. So to get started, to print or not to print. And that's the subject of a, a that's a discussion that a lot of people have nowadays is uh, do they want to print? And the thing is, um, you have to weigh the pros and the cons. And doing that, this is uh, I, I, uh, using uh, some of my reference materials, and this and it made me think of something when I was doing this presentation. It made me start thinking about why I print, and I thought I would share some of that with you. And some of these come from uh, my reference materials, and some of my own. One, the number one reason I print, and I think most people print, is you have that viewing experience there. It's something physical in front of you. Uh, it maybe that's something that the older generation, our generation really focuses on and the new generation, it's all online, but you can see at an art exhibition here, you got people milling around discussing the artwork and that's something you just can't get online. You, you, you just don't get, you don't get this, you don't get the conversation going that you do when you're actually at a, 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 an exhibit or gallery or anything like that. Number two, mobile devices don't always um, present your work the way you want it to be presented. Uh, typically, uh, most mobile devices are set up for video, so they're fairly wide screen, and and uh, especially cell phones. Basically, it's a wide screen that's you hold vertically, and it just doesn't. It, it loses a lot of uh, it, its nuances. So typically. You're looking at a, somebody showing, here, I'm showing you all my pictures on my cell phone. And this is the typical way you look at them. Like this. Some of them come in the wrong orientation. Uh, they go by quick. And you lose the tonality and the subtle and the subtleness of the image. And it crops images. So in, in panoramics, Panoramas are a total disaster on a, on a, on a mobile device because it's just a long, skinny picture. You really can't see any detail at all. But that's the typical way you see pictures when somebody say, hey, let me show you my pictures. It just goes through and that's it. Now, the next reason you print is storage. There have been prints, and there's still prints around from the earliest cameras. Uh, when photography first sure started. Some of these pictures are over 100 years old. So we know that they have a long track record of survivability if they're stored right. And contrary to popular belief, digital information is not permanent. A lot of people think once you put something on a DVD or a CD or whatever, or, or a flash drive, it's there forever. Actually, is not. They found out that digital information will degrade over time. Very long time, but it will degrade. And the other thing that you have to worry about with uh, digital storage is, uh, is it changes. Uh, does anybody remember this? Does anybody remember these or this? It's amazing. Yes, I remember them all. <laughs> 
I, it's amazing. I, if you have stuff stored on any of this media, it's obsolete. Yeah, I, I thought, um, just insert this, I took thousands of photos from the bluegrass festivals and whatnot in North Georgia. I mean, I had, I had historic photos on there as much as anything else. I mean, there's a whole A-list of people, some of which are now deceased. And um, I had them stored, I thought, permanently on DVD, and they're gone. Yeah. They're gone. Hundreds and hundreds of them. And so, uh, you, yeah. So what you have to do is if you store a lot of stuff digitally, you have to keep migrating it to the newest digital format. Because I guarantee you, if you got anything on a zip drive, the one in the middle, try find a zip drive now. You, you can't. They don't exist. They don't even make zip drives anymore. DVDs and CDs are going the, going the way of the dinosaur too because cheap memory flash drives, thumb drives, have replaced them. Hey, Genario. Yes. Um, like I've recommended before, any photograph that you really treasure and you want your future generations to look at them, your grandkids, you know, that kind of thing, you got to print them on archival paper. That's the best way to do it, not digital. Yes. That and is so, better than digital by far. And so what I do, so what I do is I constantly back up my stuff all the time. And when a new digital media come out, I will back it up again. So I keep backing up on a constant basis. And uh, something else that a lot of people don't realize and I'm sure I know one person on, on the presentation in the, in the meeting tonight has experienced a couple of them. Hard drives, regular hard drives that has the platters in it. When they start going bad, when you start hearing your hard drive go click, 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 or make funny sounds other than a whirring sound, it is time to back up everything on it because it's getting ready to die. And Solid state drives, which are the new thing now, when they go bad, there is no warning. You come in one day and it just doesn't work. So solid state drives give you no warning when they're about to go push up daisies. But at least uh, uh, the old fashioned hard drives will start making bad noise and sounds when they start going bad and it's time to back up then. Uh, so, the solution is to back, if we, you know, just about everything is on digital now because we're all using digital cameras. Back up frequently. Back your data up frequently. I back up my data on the, I back up all my Lightroom catalogs and photographs to the cloud. And, and I'm not really worried about, you know, people ask me if I'm worried about um, having um, people hack it or steal it. Yes, yeah, it's always a possibility, but you get, uh, hard pressed for anybody who, who's trying to steal your images out of the cloud. When they're stealing stuff out of the cloud, they're looking for personal information like your social security number and all of that. So they're not really interested too much in your photographic data. They're looking for personal data to steal. So I'm not really worried about that. And I back up, I back up my photographs to a, a RAID drive and I also back up my photographs to a third hard drive that I drop into a bare, uh, uh, that I back up, and then I stick that hard drive in a waterproof, fireproof safe. And, that, and I take it out once a month, back it up, back up everything, and put it back in the safe. That is my workflow for saving my digital stuff. And I also print a lot. But as, um, Someone said the best way to store your absolute favorite images is use archival paper. And we'll get to that down the path. Okay, printing at home or online? And by online, I mean print services. Print services, uh, they're very cost effective because they, like anything in the modern world, it's quantity. They print a lot. So they can offer you prints very cheaply, good quality prints on archival paper, very reasonable. Uh, 
there's a, they have a wide variety of services and I've used online printers too, uh, because now, because I can't put, there's some things I can't print. I can't print on metal. I can't print on t-shirts. I can't make acrylic prints. So that, that's when I go to the online services. Uh, with online services, you can also drop ship. If, you, if you're a professional or you're trying to make money, if someone orders a print from your website, if you have a website and they're ordering prints, you can have an online service make that print, one that you trust, like one, some of the big ones that you trust, and they could actually deliver the print, have it shipped directly to the customer. Or, and, and there are online services that do color correction for you. It's kind of hard to do online because you don't know if, what they're color correcting that you like. So that's a touchy subject. If you got old photographs, there are some online services that do excellent restoration. If you got old family photos, you can scan them at high quality scan, send them in and have them restore into a di digital format. I did that several years ago. I took all of my family, I, took, I went home to my parents, I took all of their family albums, you know, old pictures from back in the 60s and their cousins, and I scanned them all and put them on CDs and I sent them to everybody. That way, if my parents' house burns down and those photos get burned up, somebody in the family has copies of them on a CD. And I still have them and I, I'll put them, uh, you know, and I've actually uploaded those to the cloud. So yeah, that's something you can do with online services. Online services provide framing and mounting. But the biggest, single biggest reason you that a lot of people stick with online services and i've had people tell me photographers say, well i don't print anymore because it's not cost effective well maybe not but uh there's no equipment to invest in no printer no uh, uh no inks no papers so that 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 is probably the single biggest reason people print with online services is downside of on, uh, using online services. Well, if you got a deadline to meet, you can't wait to the last minute. And I'll attest to that. When we were, before COVID, when we were having competitions, I would wait to the night before the competition to print my images. You can't do that if you're using an online service. So you have to plan ahead. Uh, the final product quality uh, may not be up to what you would like. I actually had um, I actually had a uh, print uh, a metal print made uh, a few months ago, and it came in with a spot on it. And and I actually went back to the print that I sent them online. I said, "Well, there's no spot here," and they were really good. They made another print, and that's something you have to look for if you're a person who's making money with it, and they have a site, and someone orders a print from you and the online printer sends them a print, it could have a spot in it that you know is a spot, but the person who bought it doesn't know. So that's something you have to pay attention to. Um, any mistake you make, if you forgot to clone something out or remove a dust spot somewhere and you get the print back and you're like, oh man, I should have removed that. That's, that's, that's horrible. Well, that's on you. You gotta send it. You got, you gotta order another print. They're not gonna uh, give you a print for free. Genario. Yes. Um, any suggestion of who? Uh, I, as you know, I've dealt with my photo pipe here in town a few times. I know you have. I haven't done places further away. Well, I'll, I'll touch on that since you asked. I've used several different companies for metal prints. I've used Black River and they're okay. I wouldn't, I probably won't use them again. Uh, my photo pipe does excellent metal prints. Uh, the one company that I use, Bay Photo, yeah, I was gonna pull out a paper here. Bay Photo does very good metal prints and they print for some really big name people. I've been to uh, art shows and galleries where uh, people, where people had uh, metal prints, and I asked them, 
Hey, will somebody mute their mic? Where, where people had, where people had uh, prints as large as, you know, 60 inches by 40 inches printed on metal. And, and I asked them who did it, and it was Bay Photo. Excellent metal printers. They're uh, not cheap. Genario, uh, Chris Hanley, one of our excellent photographers, uses Costco. And I was going to get to that. Costco okay. does metal prints. And, and, and I haven't had a metal print done by Costco, but I've seen metal prints done by Costco. And uh, the ones I've seen look, look pretty good. They're not, they don't have, what I've found, they don't have that rich depth that you get from like my photo pipe and, and Bay Photo which has an extremely well, that deep, deep colors, you know, that you want from a metal print. Metal prints are used to, for when you want to catch and people and make them go, wow, whoa, that's just amazing. To, I, uh, scenario, I think I recently heard Costco was out of printing. Well, they're still doing online. I don't know if they're gonna, quit their online, but they're still doing online, but all of their in-store print, print, print facilities are, are gone. They, I, 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 I've had good luck with fracture for glass printing on glass. So if you wanted to do a glass print, I've never done that. Now, the one thing I tell you that Costco does well, and I've never had a problem with it. And I've always liked them are canvas prints. They do a well, they do a very good job with canvas prints and, and, and their stretching of canvas on the, uh, they double frame them. If you turn one of the canvas prints over, it's got the wrapper, the, the stretchers, and then they got another set of stretchers on the inside. So it won't warp. They do a better job of canvas prints than some of the professional places I've seen. Genario, may I mention something? Yes. I've used my photo pipe for a friend who had an ambrotype. They did a beautiful job with that onto paper. Yeah, I've used most photo pipe and they're local. Yes. They're if, local. So if you pick it up from my photo pipe, they give you a 10% discount. Yeah. I've actually had, if you look at that picture, um, uh, let's see. Oops, excuse me. Uh, let me back up. If you look at that picture, that's if you're looking at my picture uh, uh, on the Zoom, see the seahorse in the background? That was done at my photo pipe. I don't see a picture. Wait. Uh, uh, it's, it's behind this scenario on the wall. On the wall. Because oh, I'm looking, wall. I'm not looking at Janaria. I think I, I have just the. Okay. Look, look at the Zoom video of me. And behind me, you'll see a picture of a seahorse. Okay. That picture was done at my photo pipe, and it's about four and a half feet tall and about three feet wide, mounted on gator foam. So they do really good work. I've never had a problem with any of their work. So now, now this, this now why print at home? Well, the biggest reason I print at home is fun. Number one reason. I enjoy getting, it, it, this is, uh, Mike says, it's that immediate satisfaction to see your print come off the printer and you see it. And you can also make immediate adjustments. You print something, it's like, oh, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I thought. And it's like, that's horrible. And you can, and you don't necessarily have to, if you use an online service, if you want a 16 by 20 print, you order a 16 by 20 print and you may not like it. What I do is I'll cut paper down and I'll print a hundred percent blow up of a certain section and just print that to see what the quality is going to be before I go stick a 16 by 20 sheet of paper in. I'm glad you like it, Genario. <laughs> You're good at it. I, I, I go crazy doing it sometimes. I'm, I'm such a perfection. And, and the other, yeah. And the other reason I like printing at home, I get to, I like experimenting with different papers. 
and we'll get to that later on too. But because I, I use a lot of different papers, and and, and you don't necessarily, I'll, I'll buy paper. I buy the sample pack. You know, just about every paper company sells a sample pack. You know, two sheets of each paper that they make, and you buy that, and you print on it, and literally, you can see what you like, and then you just pick your favorites. You don't have to buy, you know, fifty sheet or twenty sheet pack of of that paper. And then you get it and you say, I don't like it. So I buy, you know, the sample packs, find out what I like, and that's what I'll print on. I'll just buy that. Genario, do, do any of the online printers offer any, um, you know, try us out options? Like when you have a, a print, when you can either ask them to try different papers or, you know, on a smaller size. Is that an option with any of the online printing uh, companies? Some of the online printing companies, let me pull this out. I, I, yeah, but they, what um, Bay Photo did for me when I ordered uh, a metal print, can everybody, hold on a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this smaller so I can go. I, I want to open up the um, participants. Can I, I'm trying to see, get my, Hold on a second. Uh, there we go. All right. Okay. Can everybody uh, see that? Uh, let's see. Not too well because. Uh, can you see that? If you hold it right in front of your shirt. I did with my okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Can you see? Okay, I know what's going on. Uh, if you can see that, I'm gonna stand up a little bit so you can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, this the, is a small, uh, like a three by five metal print of something I did year, uh, about six years ago, and this is the same thing. And these are metal prints, and they're done on different metals. Some are white coated, some are no coating. And, and I, what I did, I emailed them, I uploaded the image I wanted, and then they printed it on all of the different metal bases that they had. And they sent me back. Yes, you pay for that. And then you, I keep them, and then I can, I can go back and say what I want. There's satin metal, medium gloss metal, sheer metal, matte sheer gloss mat, high gloss mat, and now I can actually keep those, and it's got one of my own images on it that I did, and I can see my work. Some printers, some online printers, you can actually order, and I've actually done this. You see this? You can order swatches of their paper, so you can see the texture and the thickness. You can get a feel for the thickness and the texture of their papers, right. the printing medium, you know, right there, that's canvas. And so I have, and, and this is Bay Photo, and Bay Photo, I, I, I sent off of this, and you can see I have small, they, different papers with, with uh, different images on it. And if, you, or if you're gonna do online printing, I highly recommend going to the online printer and they all offer these swatch swatch samples of their paper with images on it so you know what you're ordering. Okay. Thank you. And you can do the same with the, the sample packs too. I order sample packs and I've literally, and I was gonna get this out and give me a second here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, Epson has a sample pack. I think it's like 20 some dollars and not that much. And, and Red River does too. Yeah, I've enjoyed them because um, you know you recommended them a while ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, wants to buy an I, can't find, I can't find it right now. But what I did. Have I got a deal? But what I did, I ordered a sample pack of one of their, uh, 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 from Red River. I ordered sample packs from Ink Press, Red River. And I haven't done Moab. But what I do is you get the sample pack, and what you do, is you print the same image on all of the samples. 
that way you can kind of get an idea of how that paper works. And what I did on all of the black and white, uh, uh, I took all of the matte paper from, from ink, from uh, Red River, I printed black and white images on all their matte paper. And then I printed another different image on all of their other papers. So I, and I, and I put it in a notebook and now I can just flip through and say, huh, what Im which paper do I like? What image might work good on this paper? And that's what I did. So I keep a notebook of all the different papers with an image of mine printed on it. Now, the other part of printing at home is how much you want to print. Uh, I print quite a bit. And I was telling my sister the other day, it's like, I need to get rid of some pictures. <laughs> I might have a yard sale one day. But the printer you see in the image on the upper left, that's basically the replacement um, printer for the Epson 3880 that uh, Jim was talking about. That is a 17 by 22 inch printer. Basically, printers are measured by, their sh by the, sh the short side of the paper. So, uh, you can put a piece of paper in there that's 17 inches wide by however long. Uh, and the floor printer, I think Don has, uh, he had a 42 inch printer, one of the, uh, something like one of these, these are called floor model printers. The one in the upper left is the largest desktop printer that Epson makes. And I think Canon makes one very similar to this. So the 17 by 22 printer, is the largest desktop. When you go bigger than that, you go to the floor model printer. And where I worked last, we had a printer similar to the one you see on the bottom and it would print, and I actually have a print that I ran on canvas at work that's five feet, it's a five foot wide printer. It'll make a print that's five feet wide by however long it is. Janario, I have a comment about inkjets. People may know this, but, um, the smaller inkjet printers use very small cartridges. I'm going to get to that. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll hold off. And I'll just comment that I have, that's an Epson P900, I believe, in your upper left. I have an Epson P800, in, in, as far as I know, in great condition. I hope the heads haven't dried. If anybody wants to buy it, it's the successor to the 3880. Talk to you, Jim. So say that again. What's the successor? I have a 3880. I'm very happy with it, to be honest. Well, they probably I'll stay with it, but the successor was the P800. And Darryl, the successor let's talk. to the P800 is the P900 that you see here. Daryl, okay. we'll talk about that offline, but uh, yeah. one more comment on the paper sizes. Um, I think a lot of the printers, you're not really limited to that uh, 17 by 22. I know with my 3880, which quit last week. Um, you can give it custom sizes and it will print on 17 by 25. And yeah. you can also do um, panoramas. Um, the, I've used yeah. the 13 inch wide paper, but uh, yeah, you know, yeah. it will go out to, you know, 30, 30 some inches, maybe 40 right. some inches. You can, you can actually buy Red River and Red, Red River and Moab now and I know Red River does, actually sells panoramic paper now. You used, to, you used to could only get panorama paper on a roll. A lot of printers don't have rolls, and then you got to deal with the, the curl in the paper. Red River literally uh, actually sells a panoramic paper that's eight inches tall by, I think, 36 inches long, and they also make it in 10 inches high at different heights by a certain length and it's panoramic and it comes in a flat box so you don't have to deal with that roll the curl yeah i've used those yeah. often and they work really yeah. well now getting the, the downside to the to printing at home is your printer your investment in the printer the ink the paper uh the cost per print goes up considerably compared to uh, online service. Um, 
paper, uh, uh, going back to the paper, paper can run, it, you know, run to, you can buy very cheap paper or you can, once you get into that archival paper, you're going you're gonna to be paying quite a bit for archival paper. Uh, you're responsible for all the repairs. Something go, you know, if it's not, once it's out of warranty, you're responsible for the repairs. But anyone who has a printer at home, there is a, uh, a company in Kennesaw that repairs Epson's, Canon's, HP printers, all those printers. They're, they're, they're uh, certified a repair service for all of those companies. You, if you call Epson, they'll give you that company's name up in Kennesaw. Uh, going back to uh, the P900, as uh, Daryl was speaking about, it basically runs for $1,200. If you have to pay tax, you're looking at $1,200 know, for, for, for that. The, the P700 is a 13 inch printer and it's $800. And then you drop all the way down to the, the P970. These are all Epson's, which is $300. Why the big difference? If you go to the printer cost, you'll see that the Epson Nine P nine hundred, the cart it has ten cartridges in it, and each cartridge is between it is forty one dollars. And I don't I can't find cartridges for my thirty eight hundred that cost because uh, these are fifty millimeter cartridges in the P nine hundred. Epson thirty eight eighty uses eighty millimeter cartridges, so my cartridges are pushing about fifty five dollars a piece. Okay. And I have to, and I have 10 cartridges. Sorry to interrupt us. Yeah, it, it turns out that the cost of ink from Epson and other companies similar to it is one of the highest cost liquids on the plant that's available commercially if you do the math. It's unbelievable what they charge. I want to warn people, Epson, I heard, and it happened to me, I think, you know, have you ever had a printer and they always want to update it all the time? Update, update, internet, update. What they're doing is they're checking to make sure you don't have non-Epson inks on there, and they will go in and sabotage that ink. Well, so Epson's got a lot of heat from that. I think there might be some legal action on that case. But if you get a request to update, don't update. It is if you have ink that's not I, Epson in there. I update my, my print drivers all the time. And I, and, and I will stress this to people. And I had a cheap print. I had a cheap Epson print at one time. And I bought some of those off-brand or, you know, refilled, uh, you know, when people refill the cartridges. The quickest way to mess your printer up is to use those off-brand cartridges or, or refilled cartridges. It, it, it will, I put, I, I, on my cheap printer, I used that one time, it never printed right until I went back to the regular cartridge. It just, the, the ink is usually crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah be careful what you yeah. buy. I agree with that. Yeah, be careful what use, you buy. I don't use it for if my you good printer. If you, spend, if you spend $1,200 on a printer, hey, yeah. buy the right ink. It's like people, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. as I was saying to a friend, you have people out there that buy a $1,200 iPhone and they go out and put a $10 case on it. It's like, you spent $1,200. Yeah. You think you would spend about 50 to 60 bucks on a case. You just invested $1,200 in a cell phone. I'm just making people aware what Epson's up to. They do that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so I don't worry about it because I always use the Epson inks. So yeah. now the thing about the cartridge sizes is the fact that I don't buy cartridges that often because my cartridges are 80 milliliters. Uh, so the cost per print goes way down because I'm not buying I haven't bought cartridges. Well, I haven't been printing much this year and last year because we're not, but I don't buy cartridges that often. And, and what, and the nice thing about the printers that have the most cartridges, like 10 cartridges, as opposed to six, you have more colors. And so you get a better quality of gradation and color when you go that route. See the Epson 3880, I'm sure the P900 does too. And, and, and the P700, I have, four different blacks and it has a matte black, it has a photo black, it has a light black, and then it has a light, light black. Right. 
That will come in very important when I get to something else later on in the presentation, you'll, you'll see why. So, and, and, and you'll find, and I know most people have those eight and a half by 11 printers, they just rip stuff off, you know, like text message, you know, for, for everyday use, you know, eight, eight by 10 printers. And they typically have these teeny tiny 19 milliliter cartridges in it. You blow through ink through, in those things all the time. You can't keep ink in those. Genario, an, yes. an, an HP executive years ago admitted they would barely break even selling you the printer, and then they took you to the cleaners on the ink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you get so, around that by buying what you just said, you buy one of these bigger things and they have huge cartridges and, and I, the and amount I, you pay per square inch or foot is much less. Yeah, that, that's one thing I, 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 I think uh, uh, someone at Showcase years ago when I bought my Epson 3880, she says, spend the money, get the bigger printer with the bigger cartridges because it will pay for itself in the long run. I, 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 used, to, I used to buy this one kind of cheap printer just for eight by tens, uh, that size, but I could literally buy the printer with a starter cartridge in it cheaper than I could buy the replacement cartridge. So I used to get, I had a stack of boxes with these, with these printers because I just bought a new printer each time. It was actually <laughs> cheaper than buying the cartridge. Well, now, now Epson has now come out with their EcoTank printers, which is an eight yeah. by 10 printer, instead of having cartridges, it's got these big bottles of ink with tubes that run into the printer. So now you've got these, they call it the EcoTank printer. So now you're not buying, constantly buying these huge, I mean, all these teeny tiny cartridges that don't last any time. I can't tell you, I got an eight by 10 printer that I use for little stuff. But let me tell you, I can't tell you how many times I go to print something that says the black ink is out. It's like, um, May I add yeah. something? Go ahead. That is uh, from my experience of uh, for the small printing. If somebody want to print just a family photo or anything, just eight by ten, you know, small size print out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way if I print it, the print out by myself, it would cost me maybe you know three or four dollars per print for eight by ten. But if I send it out, what I did, I tested what I saw it uh, on my screen, and I sent it out to different uh, online uh, places. Okay, the same image to see which which side the same paper, but different online uh, companies sell using different color profile to print out the image. Yeah, we'll get so, to that. Yeah. And then you have to wait and see which one that gives you most, more accurate color, okay? You cannot rely on a paper, you cannot rely on a site. That, uh, and then uh, compared to the cost, okay? So right now, I sent it three or four places. It took me a couple of months to get the answer to, you know, to decide which one is the best. And believe it or not, the site that I use currently is the Amazon print. Okay, mm -hmm. it cost me eight by 10, maybe just two or three dollars per print instead of four or five. And, and I don't have to fool around with the ink cartridge. I don't have to fool around with the printer. But here, here's the thing that a lot of people don't know about online services, especially like Costco. Costco used to, and I, I actually talked to one of the guys who ran a Costco print. But a part of Costco, you have to be a member. <laughs> yeah, know. well, yeah, you, but this goes probably for a lot of the, 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 the low-cost online printers, uh, uh, services. Costco used to have a program that when they, um, uh, when, when people brought, the, the bulk of their business was mom and pop, or sister and brother, family members coming in with family photos and vacation photos that they took. And it was basically with point and shoot cameras. And the guy literally told me, he says, those pictures, they would actually make color adjustments 
automatically. They had a program that would look at your picture and automatically make a color adjustment before it printed. And if you order, and, I, and he told me, if you order online, I said, well, I don't want color adjustments. He says, if you order it online, at the, at the end of the uh, online order, there's a box that you can check that says no color adjustments. But most people don't know that. And so they were, they were getting basically images that were a little different than what they expected because some, you know, if you take your pictures to like uh, CVS and they have those automatic uh, photo printers and stuff, uh -huh. that's what they do. There's, they, they make automatic adjustments, color adjustments to your images. I'm pretty with, happy with the Amazon. It's the color yeah. came out is very, very, very accurate in my the, day. The, the, thing, the thing with Costco, and that is annoying because you have to uncheck the box mm -hmm. um, at Costco in order to avoid the color adjustments. Um, and it just adds a little contrast. But I'll tell you something that I, I did a lot of, where if I do cast photos of, of a play, you know, headshots, would have, you know, 40 or 50 prints to be made. And I, there are a couple of times when it, they just came out a little too dark or something, they, they just dump all 40 of them and do them over again. Oh, and yeah. They, yeah, it was, they were so good about that. And, what, and most of the time, it was probably my fault. Um, yeah, but, and that's probably why they're getting out of that, um, that a lot of that print business because, you know, because people would complain about stuff that's like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that really was not Costco's fault. It's just they didn't like the right. picture and they're asking Costco to fix their picture. It's like, well, it's a bad picture. Right. So uh, let's continue. Let's continue on. Okay. Um, Junior, I'm sorry. Um, I, have, I have to go. Okay. Uh, so I apologize, uh, but uh, I'd like to thank everybody who was out there last Saturday. Um, we had a we had a great time out at Shield Etheridge. Um, so hopefully we'll see some of those images. If anybody has some they like to pass on to Susan out the out the farm, just send them on to me, and I'll see that she gets them. And uh, so, any rate, uh, thank okay. you. I'm enjoying this. I'm sorry I have to go. Okay. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover about printing at home is a lot of people don't realize there's two different types of inks. There's a pigment-based ink and there are dye-based inks. And, and the, pigment, the, the pigment inks is literally, uh, the colorant is suspended in a fluid as opposed to the dye ink, which is actually dissolved into the fluid. So, that that's the biggest difference between the two and the other part is when you're using a dye ink the dye ink is absorbed into the paper where the pigment ink lies on top of the paper it doesn't soak in well the, the pigment ink uh, does something for you it adds a little protection uh, uh, dust protection uh, uh, moisture protection because it's like a sealant almost on top of the paper. So it does add a little protection. It, it, it's more naturally resistant to, to the environment. It's very good longevity and, and, it's, and it has great stability. So it has a better uh, 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 qualities for longevity. Now, the dye inks, on the other hand, have a wider color gamut, where it's, they're able to print more color, more subtle color differences in color than pigment-based inks. Most printers you buy nowadays are pigment-based inks. You can still buy dye-based inks, but they're, they're not as um, popular or is not as really available uh, as uh, uh, pigment-based inks. But there, yeah. you, can, you can get Two both. Two questions? Yes. Um, does it matter, does the quality of the, of the um, delivery or the product differ based on the paper, like matte paper versus a glossy paper on the ink? And then mm -hmm. the question would be, of the printers we talked about, do they take either or they only take one or the other? Uh, some of the probably the higher end printers 
take, we'll, 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 you can find printers that will take either. They make cartridges for both, but that's rare. Most printers, usually when they come out with a, the cartridges, they only sell one cartridge, and it's probably going to be a pigment-based ink. Uh, uh, Epson makes some printers that take dye, dye inks. Um, Epson 3880 takes a pigment-based ink. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're talking about a dye-based ink, if you're printing on glossy paper, you probably won't see much of a difference between pigment ink and dye inks. But when you go to a matte paper with a dye-based ink, you better be a very good printer and know what you're doing because the ink wants to absorb in and you're going to lose a little. It's going to give you a different quality because it is being absorbed into the paper and it's like watercolor basically it wants you know it wants to spread a little bit it's not going to spread a lot because the ink do that drops is so tiny microscopically tiny it's not going to spread a lot but it's not going to be as sharp as a pigment based ink okay thank you a matte paper scenario per perhaps yes. you're going to mention it but um I, if people don't know, they should realize that there are these things called ICC profiles. I'm going to get to that. Okay, I won't say any more. Another thing is the, the thickness of the paper itself. It is to make a color different also. Yes. You, and, and, uh, the, the, you'll see the main difference in color is going to be the paper finish. Okay, what, uh, making sure you get what you see. Okay, color management. Uh, whether or not, I don't know if a lot of people know this, and I'm sure anybody who's been through art class, they know this, that all digital cameras use RGB as uh, color, and your television uh, t TVs also use RGB, which is, is called additive color. Basically, when you add two colors together, you get another color. And it's called additive. If you add all the colors together, you get white. So when you add red, green, and blue together, where they cross, you get magenta, yellow, cyan, and you'll where it all gets mixed together, you get white. And this is kind of the term of white light. Now, when you go to uh, paint, and anybody who's ever picked up a paintbrush, this is what you're dealing with. Inks, dyes, and paints on paper is subtractive color. And the primary colors change slightly, if you notice. And when you add those colors together, you get black. It's not a real black, it's more of a muddy, color that goes dark brownish black. It's not pure black, but that's pretty much what you're achieving. And when you go to printing, you have four colors instead of three. You have CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And the K stands for black, but it's not that it doesn't really stand for black. It stands for key plate. So when you print something, if you look at the bottom image, you print, you print the black, yellow, and you get the picture at the end. That's what your printer does at home. When you print something in color, that's what it's doing. It's, it's laying this down like this, and you get black. And the black is what gives the, 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 de the shadow depth and all that. But the colors come from the mixing of this. And Daryl, as a piece of trivia, I put this one in here for you. The Adobe RGB, it was developed to mimic the CMY printing. I didn't know it. Good. I put that in there just for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, this is what, and, and why this is important, especially with ICC profiles, which is, which is something coming up. When you think about it, digital cameras see red, green, and blue. We, we don't use those colors when we print. We use cyan, magenta, and yellow, and black when we print. So what's happening here? Literally, when you bring your image into a, a, a 
software to edit, that software is literally converting those colors. It's, it's, it's looking at, it, it, your camera captures red, green, and blue, and your imaging software, like Lightroom or Photoshop is saying, okay, that's red, and I gotta convert that to magenta, and I gotta convert the green to yellow, and I gotta convert the sign to print. And that's what happens in printing. Well, your, your imaging software sees the, the RGB, but when you print, the print drivers and everything have to convert all of that information from red, green, and blue to CMYK. That's a lot of math. Um, this Mario, is maybe a stupid a different... question. There's a, what I see on my screen on my computer, am I seeing CMYK or RGB? You're seeing, you're seeing RGB, adapt, okay. additive okay. colors. That's what you're seeing. Okay. You, and that's what you see on you when you look at your TV. Is What's RGB? the difference between sRGB and Adobe RGB? Excuse me? Uh, 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 RG, SRGB, sRGB was designed for the internet. It was, designed, it was designed for the internet. It's a smaller color gamut. And, and, and the uh, Adobe RGB is a wider color gamut. It contains more color. We'll get to that. Okay. So, Genario on my camera, I believe I can set it to do RGB or Adobe RGB. You want to set it to Adobe RGB. When I take the picture. You want to just leave it set all the time to Adobe RGB because that gives you the most colors okay. and the widest color gamut. And, and the reason for that is, if, and that becomes extremely important for anybody who shoots only JPEG. If you're shooting only JPEG, you need to make sure you shoot Adobe RGB because when you bring up a JPEG, and I've told several people this, when you shoot a JPEG, you bring it into your imaging software like Photoshop. Now Lightroom doesn't have a save button because Lightroom really doesn't actually save the save. It doesn't save the image. It saves the edits and not the image. But Photoshop or a lot of software, when you hit that save button, it saves it back out as a JPEG. And the JPEG is designed for the internet also. What it does, it looks at like a blue sky. If you've got an a image with a lot of blue sky in it, that JPEG algorithm is looking at it, say, okay, I got a lot of blue pixels here, okay, and JPEG is made to make the is designed to make the image file size smaller. So it's looking at stuff and say, what can I throw away and make this and this image still looks the same. So it'll say, I'll throw away every other pixel in this blue sky, and the sky will still be blue. You save it. You open it again. If you save it again as a J, if you edit it and save it again, it's going to look at that blue sky again and say, what can I throw away again to make it smaller? And it'll throw away every other pixel. You do that enough time and you'll, you'll have a file that, that's really terrible. Thank you for that explanation. That was really so, informative. So if you are using an editing software, if you're shooting JPEG only, and you bring in editing software that has a save button on it, Lightroom doesn't even have a save button because like I said, Lightroom doesn't save the image, it saves the edits. And all it does is lay the edits back on top of the original image. But if you're using a software program that has a save button on it and you open up a JPEG and you edit it and you save, a JPEG, you save it back out as a JPEG, it's throwing away information. What you wanna do is make a copy of the JPEG image you wanna edit edit that and never do a save on the original JPEG image. You wanna make a copy of the JPEG image, edit that, but never save the original JPEG image. Or, now, or, or Gennaro, you wanna make a copy of the JPEG and convert it to a TIFF and edit, edit TIFF. Yeah. That's the best way but, to do but, what, what your needs are, but yeah. Yeah, but you don't, you don't wanna say, you don't wanna ever save an original JPEG you just want to make a copy of it to something else, either a JPEG or a TIFF or something, because that way you're not losing anything. Right. And Ariel, I want yeah. to comment that the image you see on your screen on the back of your camera is a JPEG, as far as I know. 
Yes, it is JPEG. If you look at the back of your, your, your camera, that's a JPEG image. Uh, to my knowledge, no camera manufacturers uh, um, are doing um, raw files on the back of the cameras. It and takes more, take, it takes it takes longer and a lot more processing power to display. It. And, and besides, the screen is so small, it it really is not useful. So, getting back to color space, and uh, someone asked, oh, "What's the difference between uh, sRGB and Adobe RGB?" And you can see in this diagram <laughs> the sRGB, and it was literally designed for the internet. Because at the time that sRGB came out, you didn't, you didn't have monitors and, and digital cameras that could display all of these colors. So they, they came up with this and it made for smaller files too. So, but, and we'll get to why you can put stuff on the internet in sRGB and not really notice it not being uh, Adobe RGB, but I am not familiar, until I saw this image, I was not familiar with the 2200 matte paper profile, color profile. That one, that was new to me. But the latest profile, color profile is Profoto RGB, and it has the largest profile. And to my knowledge, no camera shoots with this profile. It's not available in any camera I know of. But Photoshop and Lightroom uses uh, Profoto under the hood. So it can actually use more colors, contain more colors than your display can show. Most displays can show this, but your file can actually have colors here in it. Yeah, Profoto itself has been used a lot in the cinematic uh, camera. Yeah. Yeah, digital video is used in Profoto yeah. a lot. And to my knowledge, I don't know of any still camera manufacturer who, who has Profoto as a setting. No, they're all, they all have Adobe RGB and sRGB. May I ask you something that maybe if, if you know, if I open the file as a JPEG, okay, and I convert it to TIFF, how how the TIFF add more information to the JPEG file? It, it, JPEG file is so a little limited already. Well, what the if you have a JPEG file, you you save it as a TIFF. It's going to save all the information in the JPEG file. And the thing about a TIFF is it will you can do a lossless you, you can do lossless saving. In other words, when you save it, you can sell it not to throw anything away. Lossless. No, my question save. is, I, I already save it as a JPEG. And I convert the JPEG file to TIFF. That's what I'm just saying. I, it will take all get, information. Do I get more resolution? No, you do not get more resolution. Okay. Well, you get a whole lot more. You, what uh, you file, get, what huge you get is, file size. What, what you get is the ability to save the TIFF as a lossless file. In other words, when you save a TIFF, you can tell the computer not to throw any information away to make the file smaller. Okay. So when I save a JPEG on my Apple, it to a TIFF, the TIFF file is like a factor of 10 larger or yeah. more. I mean, how is it doing yeah, because, that? Because, because it's adding, see, uh, TIFF file will support what they call, if you, if you ever use Photoshop, it supports what's called an alpha channel. And the alpha channel, if you've ever used graphics, is a transparent channel. JPEGs will not support that. And that's where a lot of the extra information is coming from, is that the alpha channel, it adds more channel, more, more color depth. And more, so you can, actually, it, you can actually convert it to like a 16-bit file instead of an 8-bit file. So that's where a lot of it's coming from. So it means that if I save it, already save it as an 8 bit, and then open and convert to a 16 bit, my resolution have not changed anything. Would that make any good for me? Mm -mm. Correct? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, let's get back on topic. Uh, we, we cover that later. Okay. 
Now, the color space is the portion of the visible spectrum that a device can achieve. And you can buy, you can buy, I think, was, what's the name of their monitor manufacturer, ESO? I think they have monitors that can show, I think they might have a- uh, ISO. ISO. E-I-Z-O. Yes, I think uh, they have BenQ, B-E-N-Q also does. Yeah. He has Pro one, you can get them, they're like 99% Adobe RGB. Yes, they're very expensive. Now the color gamut is the entire range in tones that's sort of achievable by an imaging system. And, and that's what they're talking about when they're transforming from RGB to CMYK colors for printing. And we'll get to that a little later. Now, this is something that I think most people have experienced when they print. And everybody has done this when they first start printing. Why am I print so dark? And that's because, uh, I lost my cursor. Why am I print so dark? That's because your monitor's too bright. And this brings up a thing. Back in the old days with CRT, this is the same image. On, on the left is a CRT. On the right's a, a, a you know, modern uh, flat panel LED panel. You see how much brighter it is? That's what most people are editing on now. I, I don't know anybody editing on a CRT anymore. I don't know if you can buy them anymore. But if you go into a, a computer store, and you look at all the laptops and everything is super bright because that's the way I think a, a lot of people like stuff. And if you go buy a new TV, they are always talking about how bright it is. Well, that's great for watching TV. But with editing photographs, it's detrimental. Why? Because when you make a print, that uh, a monitor is emitting light. It's called an emissive device. It emits light. A print doesn't emit light. It reflects light. And it will never reflect back the same amount of light that your monitor is giving off. And that's and when you're editing, you're thinking you're you, you, it's just right. And when you get it, the print's too dark because for that reason. So you need to bring down the brightness on your monitor. So Gennaro, is it is there a scientific way to kind of go about that to calibrate your? Yes, there is. Diet? Yeah, th yes, there is. Now the other part of printing at home, I'll get to that. The other part of getting at home is you need to have a, a, an environment, you know, like a light hood or turn the lights down low. You, you need to try to work, at, you know, under the same lighting conditions. You know, when you're, when you're editing pictures, don't wear a bright red t-shirt or a bright red shirt because believe it or not, that will influence your visual, how you see your image. If you're wearing a bright red shirt, you won't be thinking about it, but up in your head, your eye is seeing that red shirt and it's, it's influencing your, your choices of what you're doing on the screen. So I usually wear, uh, you know, a neutral color shirt or dark shirt, or I have my lights turned down real low. And, that, and I, ha I actually have a light hood like this. And you can make one of these, you can go to the store and buy some foam core black foam core and do this to your monitor instead of buying one to real easy and just use Velcro to do this. And getting back to the question that was just asked, is there a fix for this? Yes, there is a fix for this. Without spending any money, you can turn down the brightness on your monitor, make it print and see if it's what you expect. It's still too dark, turn down the monitor some more, make another print. Always use small paper when you do this. Some monitors, and, and Apple does, and most companies do now with their monitors, they have built-in color calibration. They're okay, but I've never found them to be really that good. But the best way to do it, and to get you right in the ballpark right away, is to use a colorimeter. These are called colorimeters. 
uh, uh, and basically they sit on the monitor, not all the time, but when you calibrate the monitor, <coughs> the first thing it asks you to do is adjust the brightness on your monitor. And some of these have a program that basically will look at the name brand, the model of monitor you got, it'll say, well, you got this kind of monitor. I can make, I can tell you what the brightness needs to be, or you can do it manually. I do it manual. I set mine to like 80 can, uh, candles per inch anyway, which is fairly dark for most people. And that's why I set mine. But once you get to this point where you see the, uh, the device in the center of the screen, it literally flashes like 130 color swatches on the screen, takes a few minutes, and it's reading those color swatches one by one, and it builds a color profile of your computer with that set brightness. And this literally, in, in this device, you can actually set it to uh, remind you once a month to recalibrate because some monitors, especially if they're not at the low end, the color will drift. It will shift, it will drift. So you recalibrate every month. So mine comes up every month, it turns red, and it tells me to recalibrate, and I pick it up, it sits on my desk. The nice thing about these devices also, I use the, uh, one, the one display on the right there at the bottom, that's what I use. I, I, ha I have a color monkey. The one on the left is called a color monkey, and, and the, the one up top is called a color monkey too. They, they've actually discontinued the one on the screen. You either buy one of the two at the bottom. And the one on the left can serve multiple purposes. They both will calibrate your monitor and they will both calibrate like a projector. Now the one on the left will actually calibrate your printer. So what you do, you open up the program and the program will have you print after you, you, color, you calibrate your monitor first, it will have you print an eight by 10 page and it'll have different color squares on it and a checkerboard. And then it will print, print like four or five of those in different shades of colors and a checkerboard pattern. And it will also print one in black and white and shades of gray. And what you do is you take this device and you run it over those color swatches and it builds a profile for your printer. And you can do that for each paper if you want to. And this is what some people who are really meticulous about their printing do. Yeah, Gennario? Yes. Uh, yeah, I do, I do a profile for the given paper. So you have glossy, you do one for glossy, you have another one, you do yeah. one for luster. FYI, I do have an extra 1A display studio. So if anyone's interested in it, email me. So there you go. But yeah, but yeah I do it for each kind of paper. It's a kind yeah, of thing, but, but yeah. Mm -hmm. You can Mario, do I have used one of these things to calibrate. I, I think it was vellum, mm -hmm. either vellum or rice paper. It worked yes. great. Yes, you can calibrate it for, for, for that kind of stuff too. And it works, they work great. And you will get, you will see immediate results in your prints when you use one of these. It's, it makes a world of difference. And the nice thing about the color monkey is the one that's in the black on the screen at the top is the club has one that you can borrow for free. That's a win-win. You can borrow for free, load the software and run it and then just return it to the club. Okay, print resolution. Okay, a lot of people use the words, the, the terms DPI and PPI interchangeable, and they're not the same thing. Uh, a PPI is pixels per inch, and DPI is dots per inch. Dots per inch is used for printers and printers only. PPI is for any electronic display. PP, that, and, and, and it refers to a digital image and you can see Batman there, with, which is low uh, PPI uh, setting. And you can see the one that has the higher PPI setting. And, now, and then here's the, here's the kick in the pants. The pixel density on your monitor is fixed. So if you export a picture at say uh, 80, 800 PPI, 
and then export one at a thousand PPI, they're going to look the same. They'll be just slightly different sizes, but they will look the same. You won't see any difference in it because the pixels on your monitor is fixed. And then you can we, you can go down the rabbit hole trying to figure out why this is so. But uh, if you want to, you can start googling, reading. There's a lot of stuff on the internet about this. Do you know the club? Club had to deal with this a few years ago when the images that we sent in for competitions uh, electronically were, or copies of prints. Uh, yes. Don, Don Stevens preparing the big posters for the annual meeting. Yeah. They didn't, the pictures did not look good. And yeah. so we've, we've kicked it up now, you know, it's- Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's different, Daryl. That is for printing. Well, I know. This comes in for a different. When you're just looking at stuff on a this electronic display, be it your TV or something, the pixels are fixed. So well, I know. a thousand PPI pixel uh, picture and uh, uh, say a twelve hundred PPI pixel, I mean picture, it's not gonna look different. But if you print that, yes, you will see a difference. Now, now the problem was that what we sent in, which looked okay on a screen. Yep. TV screen where did not look good when Don printed it. So we had to kick kick it up some. Yeah. You, you, anything we'll get to that later too. Uh, Daryl, one step back. It's, yes. I'm sorry it was on the colorometer thing. Do printers drift also? Like you I know monitors drift and have to be calibrated every month. Do printers that's good, drift? That's a good question, and I can't say that I know the answer to that. Okay. But uh, uh, printers, I don't know if they drift, but uh, monitors will drift. Uh, most good quality monitors don't drift that much, but they will drift over time. The colors will drift over time, especially as they age, especially as the monitor starts to age. Uh, they will, you probably need to calibrate them a little bit more often, you know, as opposed to a brand new monitor, as opposed to a monitor that's five years old. Okay, thank you. Nero, coming back to profiling papers for just a second, uh, a lot, if not all, the paper companies can provide uh, color profiles for their papers. And that's coming up. Okay. I'll shut up. <laughs> I got a lot of stuff in this presentation, believe it or not. I was surprised when I started making it. I was like, man, I got to put this in, this in, this in. Now, uh, at the very bottom, sometimes you'll see the, the, the acronym PX. That's the same as uh, PPI, by the way. Okay, and then this soft proofing is something you can do on photo, Photoshop and Lightroom. And I'm gonna be going through some of the Lightroom. I don't do soft proofing on Photoshop. I used to, and I haven't done it in a long time. I'm not sure, I'm sure a lot of the other companies like Own One and Capture One and, 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 and others have soft proofing. You'll have to delve, delve into the help or the, the directions to figure out how it works. But in Lightroom, if you look at Lightroom and you're in the develop module, in the upper right, you will see two things. One is a little monitor and the other one is a, I got something over my, this thing, it's over, uh, uh, hold on a second, I'm gonna minimize this, build this down so I can read. It has a little paper. And that's the destination and that's for printing. And this will show you what colors are outside of the which the monitor can't show. And the other one is what the printer can't print. And I'm gonna skim this because some of this is actually takes a lot of reading and it, it's, it's one of those things that you can go down a rabbit hole. Now, the reference material I'm gonna send you delves into this really detail that you can really get into that 
I would highly recommend reading. And I'm, I've reread it several times. I'm still like, I still have to go back and read it again. It's like, did I get that right? And this one, uh, soft proofing the monitor gamut warning. Gamut warning shows you colors that show up, that will show up in your print that, not, that can't be shown on the monitor. And this is, some of this is red. These spikes are red, but you see how some of the red is glowing in, in, in the image around the outside. Those are colors that my, it's showing me the part of the red that my printer will print, but my monitor won't show. It's kind of like the blinky, the, the highlight and the shadow blinkies on your camera. You see this blue area down here. That's the shadow areas that my that will print, but my monitor won't really show accurately. Is that because the CMYK you talked about earlier? That you no, said you, you no, don't see that, that is well that's it's a combination of what your monitor what your monitor can show. That, you know, this is what these colors are, they're outside of the color gamut of the monitor. Right. Or these colors, I my, my monitor is set up in Adobe RGB. These colors on the, and these this red on the outside and these blue, they fall outside of the Adobe RGB. That's what right. it's telling me. It's saying that, hey, I can print this, but these colors fall outside of the colors I can display on my monitor, is what it's telling me. Denario, is that your picture? That's my picture. That was shot in the Galapagos Islands. That thing was about two feet across. It was a big one. Now, and the other one is the destination gamut warning. And you can read a destination gamut warning showing us color in the file that you can't see on the screen. And like I said, you have to, you can turn both of these things on at the same time or one at a time, and it can get confusing. I don't use them a lot. I probably should, but I don't use them a lot. I'm sure that some of these uh, uh, professional printers use them a lot. I, I haven't gotten into using them a lot. What can you do about it? I guess that would be the question. Once you identify the problem. Yeah, you can, that's the other thing. I haven't quite figured out, once I know it, how do I go about fixing it. Like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I do a lot of printing and there's some things in the printing world that I'm still working at too. And this is one of them. So, but this will give you an idea when you click on those buttons, it'll show you, Hey, this is not, this color isn't going to print. And what's going to come into play later on, which I'm going to show you is a little thing called rendering intent. So this thing is showing you colors that, uh, you can't see them that don't really show up on the screen, but you know, which that'll show up in the print. And the other one going back to this one is okay, these colors that show up in the output that you can't see on the monitor. So basically, what you're doing is you're trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And part of this problem is rendering intent when you get ready to print. We'll get to that. And voila, I'm sure everybody's seen this in their print module on their software. And for some reason, this got put in the wrong way. This is one, this is an error. Rendering a tip is how the mod, how your printer drivers uh, show. Uh, this is a, I actually got the wrong text there, but we'll get to that. I'll show you. That's better shown than explained. Now, getting back to, um, I think Daryl, no, Jim brought this up, profiles. The color monkey, we've said before, uh, will profile each paper for your printer. But most paper manufacturers now have what they call ICC profiles. And ICC profiles are built for each paper and for each printer. So you, 
So when you find, uh, when you buy a paper, you want to go to the manufacturer's website and download the profile for that paper and your printer. It's very paper printer specific. Because basically what the ICC profile kind of does, it tells you, it tells the printer how to lay the ink down on a specific type of paper. It's the basics of it. And this is something I got from the internet. And you see uh, something else. Now I use a, a Epson 3880. And the Epson 3880's print drivers already have ICT profiles built in for all of their papers. And I'm sure Canon probably, Jim, you can, I think you had a Canon at one time. Canon probably does too. So all of their, so all of Epson's papers, the printer profile, the ICC profiles are built into the print drivers. So when you go to slip, you put a paper in, you can go to the print drive and say, I'm printing with this paper and it knows what to do. Now, when you buy a paper from a manufacturer who's not, that's other than your printer, like Moab, I use a lot of Moab paper. Those profiles don't exist in the uh, Epson print driver, so you have to literally load an ICC profile and then you can pick it. And here you can see where, say for uh, you know, this, the Colorado fiber, you can download and it tells you uh, the ink set and, and you can download the profile and what you're looking at under ink set is most of these high-end printers have a, a, a photo black which I would say is gloss black or dark black and they have a matte black and what that's what it's uh, that's what it tells you right there how to you know what it's going to print with and it also tells you usually what part of the printer to feed the paper into. A lot of these big, my printer has three feeds on it. It has a, a tray feed, it has a rear feed, and it has a front feed. Thick paper goes into the front feed. And, and fine art tray would probably be the rear feed. When you're printing on high quality paper, you feed it one sheet at a time sometimes through the rear feed. And it tells you how to do that. And, and, and a lot of times it'll tell you what paper to select, what settings from Epson to select. So and you can see up the top where I have Epson 3880. And this is all of the IC, this is only a portion of the ICC profiles that you can download. And this is the fun part. Print media. The inkjet, uh, inkjet papers come in a lot of different finishes and a lot of different qualities from ultra cheap to very expensive. And these, my go-to paper for myself is my luster. When I can't figure out what to print something on, I'll print it on luster. It's sometimes called satin, but most companies have dropped the satin term, I think. Most of them call it luster now. Uh, and it's an all around, good all around paper. Has a slight texture and has a, has a sheen to it. And it keeps good detail and good color saturation. And it's probably the most widely used paper finish done. If you go to an online service, service, service and you don't specify paper, this is typically what you're gonna get. You go to Costco, this is what you're going to get. You go to CVS, you're going to get a luster or satin style paper. And you, like I say, you can get it from low end to high end fine art papers. And it takes ink well, and it's very durable. The surface is usually very durable on all of these papers. So uh, like I say, I usually keep a lot of this on stock because like I say, it's my go-to paper when I don't know what to print on. Any questions? And the next one, uh, glossy papers. Glossy papers are those papers that have a bright white finish, high gloss, 
that everybody has seen, I think, and the, you can get the most saturation out of these papers. These per, if you want something that's highly saturated, this is the paper to go with. The drawback to, to glossy papers is they're highly reflective. So most, most photographers I know use this paper only in, in, a, in an area when they know what the lighting conditions are gonna be because you can get a lot of glare and you can actually, I've actually seen people changing the angle that they look at a photograph like this to get the glare off the image. So that's definitely something that uh, you want to consider. Now, metal prints typically are high gloss anyway, but you can get metal prints now that are not gloss. So. Genero? Uh, yes. Does not glossy use the least ink? compared to some other papers, most other papers? That I don't know. I, think I does, know matte papers want. use the most ink. <laughs> oh, that's a, yeah, it's a, I think the glossy uses the least, but I, I can't be sure, but it's one, it's one of the least, for sure. Yeah, I know matte. So if you're on a budget, you, I would probably use glossy, but lesser is probably better, but glossy would work. Too, yeah. Generia, but, are, is four by six available as luster? Because I, I know my sample things when I print, yeah. I print four by six, <laughs> but it's always glossy. I'm, I'm tracking my brain, I don't think, Depending on who you buy, who you buy from, yeah. But yeah, you should be able to get uh, glossy as a uh, four by six. No glossy. I want luster. I always have glossy because oh, luster uh, should be easy to find in four by six. Four by six. Okay, yeah, I have to, I have to check. To I got a I bunch of glossy stack, four by six. I think okay. I got a stack of four by sixes when uh, Showcase went out of business. That's all luster. Uh huh. Okay. I just Thanks. bought packs of it because it's like, well, I can use this as test prints. Yes, I use it for test prints, and I've always used the glossy. And I'm listening to you, realizing that may not always give me the best feedback. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now, you know, is uh, semi glossy and last is about in between semi glossy. Yeah, uh, I think the semi gloss is more like a satin. Satin is kind of a smoother texture. The luster tends tends to have a little rougher texture. They're very close to each other. It's it's almost hard to distinguish between the two, but I'm sure there's a little difference. But most people, I think most companies, I don't see many companies marketing luster. I mean, not luster, but satin anymore. Most companies now have gone totally to what they call luster. And uh, I don't know how they determine what's luster and what's satin. Now, something a lot of people some people have heard of, and a lot of people have not heard of, is DMAX number. A DMAX number is basically, most people don't concern themselves with it, except for really high-end printers or people really looking uh, for the maximum black. It is basically the darkest black you can get on a, on a paper. You know, you can print some papers and you can print a black and white and you can say that's supposed to be totally black and it comes out a little gray looking. That's what they're talking about, D-Max. And then you can go to another type of paper and print that same image that came out a little gray and it's like this glorious, lustrous black. And that is the D-Max paper. Uh, Epson has a... Uh, has a a set of papers called legacy papers. And that's part of the claim to their legacy papers is the fact that uh, uh, they have high DMAX numbers. So if you're playing black and white, you might want to consider looking at the DMAX number of the paper if you're playing black and white, especially on a, on a map. So the higher the number, the darker the black can be. And this is one reason, you know, you know, you, I'm talking about DMAX number. And this is something to consider. Like when I printed this, uh, this is at uh, uh, that, that mill up in near Rome. And I printed this on matte paper and it turned out really well because this particular paper had this high DMAX number and, and that black sky came out great. I, it just made the picture. And if I had printed this on a lesser paper that didn't have that high DMAX number, it probably would have been a, on, a, on a grayish side. But this is what you, 
but if you're looking to print, if you're a black and white printer, you're somebody who's into black and white prints, yes, you, you probably should investigate the DMAX number of the paper you're, you're buying. And the best way to do that is look at the, look at, go to the internet and then buy the sample pack of the paper and try it out. Okay, metallic gloss and metallic luster. This, these are relatively new papers to come on the scene and the first one I used was by Epson. Uh, I used their metallic gloss and it's supposed to simulate kind of that, uh, that, that, Kod that Kodak, Adura, that Fuji pearl finish uh, back in the old film days. Remember, uh, what was the one, that what was the other Kodak? Uh, thing that uh, had uh, their high gloss. I forget the name of it now. But this is what these papers are supposed to simulate. And they do a good job. My favorite, though, is uh, the, the metallic luster. Gorgeous paper. It, it, the first time I printed, I liked it glossy, but uh, the, the luster is absolutely incredible. So, and it has, it keeps sharp detail, good color saturation. And, and, and everything, and it's great. And if you got an uh, image with reflections in it, like water or something, it's, it's, it's great. Matte papers. I'll tell you right off the top of the bat, the first time I started trying to print matte papers, I went through a lot of money. Yeah. Matte papers are difficult to print on to get good at it. And uh, they, they have a non-reflective surface, but matte papers come in two types, a hot press and a cold press. And the hot press, think about it as uh, uh, iron, like you're doing your clothes, ironing your clothes. It's the, pr the paper is actually pressed with, with hot, uh, hot uh, plates to smooth out the surface. So you get a hard, smooth surface with hot pressed papers. The cold press papers have a softer textured finish, more like watercolor paper. And you can actually feel the texture. If you take your hand, you can actually feel the texture in the cold press. It is a very soft paper. Uh, this picture that you see here was printed on a hot press paper. Great for black, uh, matte papers are great for black and whites, but you can do some stunning, I've seen stunning details, stunning images on matte paper in color. Now, matte papers also have two colors, basically. Uh, they have a natural color and cold presses are typically the natural color, but not always. But you can get uh, matte papers come in a natural color where the paper is it's white, but it has a warm tone to it. And more often than not, the hot press papers, and not always again, are brighter. And they achieve that brightness through some kind of bleaching or something of the paper. So it's a bright white, where the, where the other one is more of a natural white. And it's usually a warm, softer white. It's not bright at all. So that color will come through in your images. And you can use that to your, to, you can use that as part of, as trying to establish a mood in your image. Do you know, is the, is the D-Max um, similar across these different papers? For, exa if, for example, a cold press and hot press would the D max number be the same for each, different for each, is it unique for it each? It will probably be paper? different for each one. Okay. Yeah, it will be different. They might be close, but they won't be exactly the same. They will be close, but not exactly the same. Janario, mm -hmm. I want to bring up something. I don't believe you have mentioned. If you have, you tell me. Um, since you've got two kinds of, ink, of blacks, you've got the, oh, that for the uh, matte and, and other black for the uh, one we call non-matte or the glossy or whatever. 
Uh, one thing that often happens, even in high-end printers, is when you switch papers, they have to blow out the lines. Yes. <laughs> and, and they have a little uh, collector in them, which collects all that ink that's being blown out. You have to change that thing periodically. Yeah, it blows it into kind of a spongy type, of, right. uh, like a big sponge. So really, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. When you print on my Epson 3880, when I print, usually if I'm going to print on, on non matte paper. I print all my prints on non-matte paper. Then if I'm going to print matte, I print all my matte paper images at the same time. In other words, back to back to back. I don't print a glossy image and then I don't print, a, I don't, my, my workflow is I don't print glossy, then a matte, then a glossy, then a matte. Because every time you switch from glossy to matte, they're, they're ink lines in the printer, it has to flush that line out because it's switching from a matte ink to a glossy ink and it has to flush that line out each time. So if you do print all of your non-matte paper images at, at one time and then make the switch. So now you only switch one time and then it will, and then it will purge the lines. And then after it purges the lines, it, it will print with the matte ink. So yes, and, and, and a lot of people complain about it's wasting ink. Yeah, but what can you do? Well, the, the Epson Peak 900, the one which you showed, doesn't do that. Finally, Epson got but, away from that. Put uh, separate lines in. The yeah. world. It probably That's cool, that's good in. to know. Yeah, that's really that's good, good to know. know. It put separate, in other words, they put separate lines in for the, for the matte ink and, and the other inks. So that's good to know. I, I didn't agree. Know I want to briefly note that you got to make sure you clean up that ink. The ink's going somewhere, right? Going to that storage thing. But if it overflows, it can ruin your printer. You've got to make sure you keep it clean and, and, uh, and don't forget that yeah. because it's easy to forget. It, yeah. 700, I think, same story, but I'm not sure. Yeah. A little smaller, less expensive. Well, yeah, the, the, P, uh, the, 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 R, the P800 has, the, which I have, has the, the what I call it, senior retirement disappear every time it switches from matte to the other kind of ink. So I just don't use matte at all. Okay. Anyway. And we're down to the, we're down to almost the final ink. I mean, the final paper. Now, the, now you get into what uh, Mike came up with at the very beginning, uh, archival papers, uh, otherwise known as fine art papers. Actually, they all can be fine art papers. You can get fine art papers in uh, 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 luster and stuff, but typically the fine art papers aren't luster, but uh, fine art papers really come down to the fact of their content. They're 100% cotton rag. Why? It's because paper made from wood pulp has what they call lignans in it. And basically, have you ever seen old paper when it's got brown spots, look like, looks like uh, uh, aged spots on somebody's skin? That's what paper from wood does, unless it's treated. Now you can get paper made from wood pulp that is archival, but it goes through a treatment process where it has to remove all of those, those the, those compounds in the wood to make it archival. So mostly archival papers are all cotton or sometimes referred to as rag. They typically have a smooth texture, low reflectivity. They're not matte. They can be matte. You can get fine art papers that are totally matte, but the ones that aren't totally matte are like the uh, uh, Epson, you know, Exhibition Fiber, which is the image you see there. It's printed on uh, Epson Exhibition Fiber, and it and it's uh, it's a great paper. I print a lot of my matte papers or Canson papers, which Canson is from the old uh, Intaglio 
printing days when people used to make, you know, etchings and stuff. Uh, Canson was big into that and they've moved into inkjet papers and I've used a lot of theirs and I like their matte papers too. And Barada is a type of paper. It's a name for the treatment of paper. And basically it's, it's a paper that has almost a, has a clay finish to it. And I have a definition for that at the end and we'll get to that, but it's, but you'll find a lot of uh, fine art papers referred to as Barada and that's a process uh, of, that, that's done to make the paper. Do these papers have a greater longevity? I mean, the term yes. archival always makes me think they're going to last yes. forever. Yes, they, well, archival has, is a two prong attack. First, you got to start off with a material, which is archival, which is 100% cotton paper, and then it's storage. You know, you got to store stuff right. Yeah. And, 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 and and, and a lot of these old pictures that people find, you know, that are 100 year, photographs that are 100 years old, 150 years old from the Civil War or something like that, they, they, they were made, uh, uh, you know, they used cotton a lot to make paper back then. And two, those pictures, a lot of times they were stored away in family albums that they never saw the light of day. They weren't exposed to UV, so a lot of them lasted a long time. And next are specialty papers. Now specialty papers is something I like to play with and I've been playing with lately. And uh, some of the specialty papers and these two specialty papers that I show here are from Moab. And if anybody's never used Moab papers, Moab makes excellent papers. And I came across the first one, which is called Slick Rock Silver. The paper is actually that silver color there that you see. It's silver, it's not white at all. It looks like somebody spray painted it with silver. And you can get some really, if you're looking for a dark, uh, you can get some really saturated colors on it. And it has a very reflective surface. This image you see of the clownfish I printed on uh, Moab silver rock, uh, slick rock silver. And, and the other image is printed on a mulberry paper made by a company out of, by Japanese paper manufacturer that Moab uh, buys from. Moab, you get this paper from Moab, and, but they don't make it. It's, they, they, it's done through them by a company in Japan. And it's made, and, and it's made from mulberry. But, and they also make a paper that's mulberry that's smooth. But this mulberry has, you can see the strands of the mulberry in the paper. And I printed this mushroom on it because I thought it added a bit of a mood to the, to the image a earthy natural you know it's earthy natural texture so I, that's I, that's why i printed it on this and you see how that came out in area that mushroom looks like it's growing right out of the paper yeah that's one of my favorites but yeah you can get bamboo paper you can get rice paper and all kind of papers and, and and some of these are archival and some of them are not. I think both of these are archival quality. Now, when you get to... Did your printer... I'm sorry, print did your printer have any issues handling this particular paper? No. I, I just downloaded the uh, ICC profile from Moab and printed. Now, I'll tell you for a fact, the Moab Slick Rock Silver, it's it can be difficult to print on because what you 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 see that image you you really got to be careful about what image you print on that slick rock silver you can print one image on it it looks great like this like the like the clownfish and you print another image and it's like oh my god that's horrible 
it's, it's a paper you got to be careful about the image you put on it because it's just because of the silver back the silver surface but when you get the right image it works it works really well i don't think it works well the slick rock silver does not work well with black and white images at all in my opinion it, it just I only would print color. I tried a couple of black and white images on them and I literally almost immediately tore them up. They were just like, ah, oh, this is not, this is not coming out right. So, yeah. Now these papers can run, now papers can run, like I said, cheap, like the bamboo, I mean the mulberry paper, 10 sheets can, I think 10 sheets are like $73 for 10 sheets. It's, it would tax us a little over seven dollars a sheet. That's for thirteen by nineteen. That's how expensive that paper is. So you don't waste paper. Janaria, how do you work around when you're planning? And just a little advice when you got these expensive papers in your mind, but sure you can't run sample sets. How do you fix your mind to plan I, I, to not I, get financially burned? Well like this mulberry paper you can buy it in like a little sample pack that doesn't cost an arm and a leg and they give you mm -hmm. eight by tens you know like two sheets of two sheets and then i can cut them in half <laughs> okay and run test yeah. prints that way okay that makes before sense. you before you commit and and when i pick an image i try to marry it up with what i'm trying to show and that's why I went with this mulberry paper because I just wanted that. This mushroom has this mysterious look to it, and then it's 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 like it's natural. It's part of the earth, and I was trying to convey that with the bam with the with the fibers in the paper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So you try to create a mood uh, yep. with with it, and yeah. So I buy sample packs like i showed you here this is a sample pack of epson legacy i wish i could get this yeah. this is a sample pack of epson legacy it's got three sheets of four different papers in it yep and you don't have to print the whole eight and a half by eight and a half by eleven sheet you cut it in half and a quarter it and That's see how that you that like makes sense yeah that does make yeah. sense mm -hmm. now uh, get into it. You invoke a mood with a paper, and this is probably the most important thing. I think a lot of people ask me this: How do I pick a paper? Like the image on the on the left there, the lady. I after I converted it to black and white, I looked at it. It's like, oh man, this is, I, I want to kind of convey a soft, warm look, and that's why I went to an Epson fiber paper. I didn't want a total matte. The the Epson fiber has a slight sh texture to its sheen but not heavy you can hardly it, you have to see this paper to see what i'm talking about but it has a warm tone to it and that's what i went with with this so you're trying to trying to um, it makes the highlights warm and you know in the top of a head the hair it, it makes the highlights very warm so that's what i was trying to convey here a soft you know image quiet you know beauty and and uh that's why i went with that and then in the image in the middle you know i had all these lights and colors and the reflections in the water so that i naturally went epson luster metallic luster that's what i went this could also be printed on uh, a high gloss paper too and um, it would work just as well on a high gloss paper now the, the, now the image on the right, that's an Epson Ultra Glossy Premium. And the reason I went with the, the really glossy, I wanted to give this kind of a pop art feel. So I wanted to kind of jump off the page pop art because I knew the background was all blue and bright. Everything was bright. It was almost like pop art. So I went with a glossy kind of a image that, you know, made it look like an advertisement or something. That was actually Mario, that metal picture. Huh? Atlantic Station? Yes. Atlantic Station. I didn't know there 
there's a fountain down or that water. Yeah, there's a fountain down there. Huh. It's the fountain is near the IKEA in that section over in that area. But yeah, there's a fountain there. So, but so when you're picking paper, you want to try to. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, you want to try to um, uh, invoke a mood. Here I use uh, uh, sign etching, matte paper, and on the the other one, the shark. It's just you know my run of the mill catch all luster. Okay, printing, about, about there. So I'm wondering if I can show you, uh, uh, I'm gonna switch to, I'm gonna close this down and open up um, Lightroom. Can, can you guys see Lightroom? Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay. Okay, Lightroom. And this is it. In Lightroom, to print, the first thing you do in the light in the print module, you go to page setup, print, uh, uh, no, excuse me, I hit the wrong thing myself, uh, paper setup. And you can pick the printer. You pick your printer, and here's my Epson 3880. And then you can pick these are the sheet sizes I can work with, or I can make a custom size. And if you go over here, you can see where it uh, says 11 by uh, 11 by 17. You can see 11 by 17. You can see 11, and depending on which feeder you send it through, you can say retain size, expand size, borderless. Gennaro, uh, yes. what, we, what we are seeing, it says Lightroom print module. Is that what we're supposed to see? Yes. Okay. It's with the mushroom in it? Yeah. Yeah. But you see a mushroom? Yeah. Yeah, that's what you're supposed but to it, But it's static. We don't see a cursor moving. Cursor is not yeah. moving. Uh, sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Uh, okay, it's doing something weird. Okay, uh, you know what? Uh, hold on a second, guys. Where's Zoom? Let me stop sharing and reshare, okay? Yeah. There we go. You can see that now? Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. All right. Uh, okay, I'm in the print module in Lightroom. Most printer print modules probably run pretty much, uh, probably very similar. Uh, but uh, I, I print from Lightroom all the time, so that's the one I know. First thing you do is you, 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 I open up my uh, page setup, and I can pick pick the paper. And you can see different papers, same paper size, eight and a half by eleven. Depends on what you're feeding it through. You can tell it to feed it through the rear or the sheet feeder. And 17 by 20, you know, you can feed it from the sheet feeder manual in front. It depends, and, and you can do different things. So, and you can actually create your own uh, sizes. So let's cancel out of that. Starting at the top up here, you can tell it to print a single image or package, picture package. And by picture package, you can print like you used to do when you were in elementary school and you got, got your school pictures and they, they have a bunch of little wallet sizes and, and one big eight by 10 for you and, and all that. I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> you, that's what you can do. You can actually do contact sheets 
You know, if you're, you have a client and you want to do a contact sheet, you can create contact sheets with different things in it. And then, and, uh, and all that, or you can create a custom package. You can create different things in a custom package like that. Uh, go back to single image. Uh, go back to single image. That's a four by six. And I can expand that around. Or you can go back to image settings. Now, uh, let me get that back to, go back to here. All right. Now, if you notice, there's a little button called Zoom. My image, my, my, I have it set up as an eight by 10. And it actually tells me this is what's going on down here in the layout. God, cell size is eight by 10, eight, 10 high, eight wide, because I have a single image selected. And in the zoom, I can tell it to, I can tell it to feel that eight by 10. If I turn zoom off, it's telling me my picture image is actually 7.4, seven and a half by 10. It doesn't really, I, I didn't crop it as an eight by 10. I cropped it to what I felt like. So it's not eight by 10, but if I say fill to zoom, it will fill that eight by 10. It will expand it out. But here's the thing. When you do that, if there's any extra, you, if the picture right. becomes larger, you can actually move it around in that cell to get it just right. Uh, you can rotate the fit. And you can always know what that is. Now, a lot of images, I know there's a couple people I know that like to put a stroke border on the image. And you can see that stroke border. I'll change that stroke border to to a color, you see the blue color on the image? Yes. You can, you can stroke the image if you want to put a little border around it. Okay. I've only done that a few times. Here you can adjust the margins. All my margins are set by the printer and you can change the grid. If you want to change the grid, the number of grids on there, you can see this is how you can create a, a grid, print different images. You can put a different image in each grid. This is the size that I'm printing. If you're printing a square image, you can tell it to keep it square. And this is all self-evident, you know, shows the rulers at the top and the margins and the cell image, the dimensions, it shows the dimensions up here. And if I want to, I can put a identity plate, kind of a watermark. The only thing about this watermark is it's always in the center. You can't move it. You can change the size and you can change the opacity and you can change the color, but you can't move it. Hmm. Well, you can. You can move it around. That's the first time I've been able to move around. I clicked on it. But you can move it around thusly and put your own watermark. You can, that's your name. That's a, they call it identity plate. Now, watermark, you can create a watermark on there. And the watermarks are created in two places. Here I can, I, we did this one and I can put a watermark on there. You see there's the watermark. And I will show you how to get a watermark. Page options, you can tell it numbers. <laughs> Just put a number down here in the corner. Page info. And crop marks, you can put all that on there. The other thing is photo information, you can change, you can edit that to show any of this information that you want. It'll, it'll put it along the bottom of the image. This comes in handy if you're 
you know, like a wedding photographer, and you send you send the uh, married couple uh, contact sheets or a book of proofs, and you tell them to pick out the images they want for their wedding album, and they refer that you can have them refer to the number. I want this image here, and I want this image here by the number instead of a, uh, you know, you trying to figure out what they want. So you can send them proofs like that. This you can change the font size of the proofs. And this is the um, where the magic happens here. Uh, at this point, you can pick whether you want to export this out as a JPEG or send it to the printer. By sending it as a JPEG, basically you set it up to be printed and then you print it out, you send it as a JPEG and then you can send that file to a printer. I rarely ever use this because I do it a different way when I send stuff to a printer. And I will show you that. This is the print resolution right here. This, you notice it says PPI, pixels per inch. You should never print anything, and this is going back to when someone was mentioning that Don got pictures that didn't print well. That's probably because the PPI was set too low. I never have this number set any lower than 300. Most printers, their base setting is between 300 and 360, and they can go up and they can go up from there. But when you start dropping down around 200 to 100, your printers look pixelated. They look bad. So I always have this number set to at least 300. Print sharpening. I don't really, I always leave this as standard. And you can set the prints, the, the, the sharpening, either glossy or matte, whatever. I, rare, I don't often use it because I really, to be honest with you, I don't really notice any difference because I sharpen my images before I send them to the print. I, I don't use it generically at all. So. Yeah. Um, here, you see, this is where you pick the, mo the profile, see the color management. Now what you want to do with color management is, this is all the, these are all the papers I've ever used. <laughs> you have enough. Uh, these are all the papers I've ever used. And you pick your color profile. And then this is that one place I told you about perceptual or relative. And with these two images, uh, I would always print with perceptual relative. What the difference in these two, it, this is where the translation comes in from the electronic RGB color to CMYK. This is where this comes into, into play. This perceptual, what it will do is if you have colors that are outside of the gamut, color gamut of the printer, in other words, if there's a color that the printer can't actually print, it will do its best to keep the image looking exactly like you see it on your monitor, but it's going to have to recalculate that color. And it's going to do it the best job it can. And for 99% of the time, you won't even notice it. But that's what's going on. Because it literally had the, the print drivers have to translate from, R, from RGB to CMYK. And there's going to, there are going to be colors that it can't, the printer can't handle and the monitor can't show. And what it's doing is it's trying to, it's doing a balancing act is, okay, I have a red color here that's just outside of the color gamut of the printer. I got to move it back into the color gamut to where I can print. And so I, it does its best to move it back within the parameters of the, to a red color that the printer can print. Now relative, on the other hand, it's used to, uh, it's used to, uh, 
for people who are in commercial, a lot of commercial art, especially advertising, say for instance, you were shooting for uh, Coca-Cola and you were shooting an ad for Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola has a specific red that in their advertising you need to hold. When you shoot their advertisement, what you want to do is you want to set this to relative and you will do a color swatch with, uh, in your image. Now when you print, it's not going to make any adjustments to that red. It's going to hold that red dead on. I mean, it's going to get it as close as possible. In other words, it's not going to make any shifts in the colors. So when you want a specific color to be rendered in your print, that's got to match something in real life, you want to set it to relative. Probably 99% of everything you print won't be, will be set to perceptual. And that's really the difference. It's this, that's where the translation between your, your software and the printer comes into play. And that doesn't matter whether it's black or white or, or color. Uh, it mostly works with color, but yeah, black and white. Now I'll, I'll get to something else uh, in a minute here with black and white. Now, black and white, your printer, your, your, your printer it uses color, and most of these profiles are color. But I, doubt, I found a couple of black and white ICC profiles for Canson paper on Canson's website. They have black and white profiles. In other words, what, these pro, what those profiles do is they ignore color. They only see black, white, and grays. They ignore the color. Now you can achieve that, and I'll get to that in a minute. Now I'm gonna set the, and you can do print adjustments here. I really never touched this. I don't think I've ever adjusted the brightness and the contrast at this point in my print. Now, uh, under this, Sometimes, and I've done this, can you see the top there? It's like it's cutting it off. At the top, there is a, the, at the top of the ICC profile list, there's a command called color managed by printer. So sometimes when I print a black and white picture and I've, and I've done it as a test and I've told other people about it, all of these profiles here are color profiles on words they take in color account and you've seen people when they say uh, go somewhere and they print a black and white and it has kind of a greenish tint cast to it or bluish cast to it that's where the color profile is coming to effect it's influencing the black and white so if you want to try to get rid of that you have the printer manage the color because the printer if you're printing black the printer doesn't really see color. It sees only black and white and grays anyway. So you tell it the printer to manage the color. I mean, to manage the print. And it will ignore all the color and it will just print black, white, and grays for your print. And if I send this to the printer, now I'm using a Mac. This, this will be a little different for people using Windows. This is, a print, this is where the print drivers come in. And literally, I go into paper setting, printer settings right here. And you see here, all of the, these are all Epson papers. And depending on what paper I pick, if I put, if I, if I selected, uh, you notice what I did, this is this paper here, this this profile here, the Moab uh, Corsau, uh paper. This is a, another Mulberry paper. Epson doesn't make that paper. So how do I, how, how do I tell the print driver to handle that? Because that paper is not listed here. When you buy paper from a manufacturer other than your printer manufacturer, it will have a sheet of paper in it. 
that comes in the, that comes in the box of the package with the paper, and it will tell you what paper to set that is. Because what we'll do is it'll it'll tell you it's like okay, uh, use this fine art this proofing paper here or this. And I think it told me to use Legacy Barata to print with this Epson profile. It'll tell you. So when you buy paper from your manu uh, from your paper, there'll be a sheet of paper and it'll tell you how to set this according to your printer. And you, so don't throw that away. A lot of people throw that away, but it's got some really important information on it. If you throw it away, you can actually go to the website and they'll tell you what media type to use. And it's called a media type. It'll tell you what media type to use to print with that paper because that's not an Epson paper or it's not a Canon paper. You're using a paper other than, than, than that wasn't made by the printer manufacturer. It'll tell you how to set the media type. Because when I, when I print, uh, when I print, I have some, some cheap paper from Costco, glossy paper from Costco. I use the Epson premium photo glossy for that. Now, Another thing I use is um, when I print black and white uh, matte paper, I always set it to 1440 DPI. Because I found when I use the Super Photo 20, 20 DPI, it lays down way too much ink and it gets <coughs> mud. I, I usually set it for high speed. High speed, what it does at high speed for most printers, it lays down ink in both directions. Basically, when it goes to the left, it lays down ink. When it comes back, it lays down ink. If you turn this off, it lays down ink only in one direction, then the head comes all the way back and it lays down another row of ink. It doesn't change the quality. It just depends, uh, it just depends on how fast it prints. And Ariel, I've, I, I use Epson printer and when I print, print black and white pretty much all the time now. I just let the printer do it. Yeah. I, I take away Photoshop control. Yes, uh, print, the printer sees black and white. It doesn't see color. So you can actually go down and uh, co uh, 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 color matching. Let's see where it's printer settings. And, and, and you can turn, you can turn, turn right now. I have the, the you see it's, it's Epson, Color manager is off because I'm using this pro. I'm using this profile to print with. But if I go back to here, go back to the top, printer manages color, and go back. Yeah, it's still. Well, I, that's because I still got the wrong paper set, but it literally ignores the color and just prints black and white grays. So when, if you're printing black and white images and you're getting a color cast to it, that's coming from the profile because you're using a color profile to print with. So let the printer manage the color, uh, to manage everything when you're printing black and white. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, if you're using Lightroom, for those using Lightroom, and I'm sure a lot of people are, uh, in export, and this is where, when I send pictures, when I send files to um, an outside service to be printed, this is what I use. I don't use the print module. I, I, I go here. I get my picture exactly the way I want it. Go to develop. I get my picture exactly the way I want it. And then I, I can do right here, I select burn full size JPEG image or to my hard drive and I have a directory I put images in for different things. You know, if I'm sending it to Bay Photo, I have a folder for Bay Photo, things I've sent to Bay Photo, and, but this is where I do it and I export it from here. And, and it's basically the same thing as sending it from the print module. And, and, and a lot of people, you can 
send tiffs, but tiffs get really big and really you don't see a noticeable difference in it. Now, and I have, you see here, people who don't know, whenever I send digital images in to the club for the digital competition, I already have a thing set up where I say APS right there and it does everything. All I have to do is change the name and it, set, it, sends, it sets it up just the way for everything is already set and it just exports it. Now, uh, where the watermark right here, this is where you can do your watermarks in the export module. You can click on watermark and these are all the watermarks I've done over the years. You know, there's 2014, 2015. Uh, I have uh, 2020 with my name, it's in black. And then I have 2021 and, and you know, different things. But if you want, a, you want a new one, you just go edit, you just pick one and say edit watermark and it brings up this window. And you see there's the watermark and you can actually change the text of the watermark. You can change the size where it's positioned, uh, 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 where it's positioned on the screen, the opacity of it, everything. And you, where it's positioned on the screen, middle, bottom, you know, you can move it around. You can, you can set how far it is from the margin. Uh, everything. Scenario, can you can you go back to the export? Yeah. yeah. So I see. Apparently, in your dives, you have run across a mermaid because one of your presets sends it to mermaid. Yep, I did a I did a bunch of mermaid. You've seen those shots. But yeah, but th that's that's pretty much it. The printing part is pretty easy. The the key to printing, in my opinion, is all of the prep work. You know, you need to calibrate your monitor. You need to, you know, download the right ICC profiles for the paper you're using with the printer, and and, and that type of thing. The printing part, pushing the button and send it to the printer, that's easy peasy. General. That's that's the so base. you set up the DPI to a 14. Is that specifically for Epson? Uh, no. Uh, well, that's Epson, yes. Epson, but, you know, uh, I'm sure Canon printers have something very similar. They usually have two ranges, you know. I'll send it but to... Majority I'll, is a, yeah, either 300 or 360 DPI. No, that's PPI. No, it's a DPI. That's the printer. Once again, the printer uses PPI. I mean, not. I mean, DPI. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but when you're, but but the resolution of your image is dependent on your PPI. That's correct. But so so always set. I don't 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 take too much. Don't put too read too much. If you in doubt. Set your PPI for 300, and yeah. you'll get a good image. That that's all I've ever used is 300 or 360, 300 or 360. I've never used anything else other for. for okay. Thanks. Yeah. Like I say, you can go down a rabbit hole on that DPI PPI thing. This was a brilliant presentation, Jerry. Thank you. But what I would do, I'm gonna. Stop one more time and go back to, let me open this back up and share screen one more time. What is, oh yeah, here. Open this back up to full screen. Okay, I'm gonna go. I showed a lot of this in, in oh, okay. This is, this, you, everyone will be getting a email that I, the way I always usually send it out of this one slide. And this, for anybody who wants to know 
all of you technophiles and everybody wants to know about DPI and PPI and, and this, that, and the other thing, get this book. It's free. Oh. These, are all, these are all links. So you just click on, they're all links. So click on it and, and, and uh, demystifying the world online, print resolution, DPI, converge, has a DPI, PPI conversion. There you go. You just, you read this and you get all your answers. Oh, excuse sounds, me. Like good, sounds like a good bedtime read. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is Barada paper? Rendering intent. This goes in more detail about rendering intent. And Being you will probably go to sleep on it. It's like reading a technical journal. <laughs> really, okay. if, and for people, and I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this company, IT Supplies. All they do is printers. They sell. It's the online. They sell printers, papers, inks, calibration tools. The works. Okay, folks. Uh, make sure you. Uh, uh, Jared, you did a great job. Is uh, man, you're just a man of knowledge on this one. Uh, that's for sure. I feel like. I feel like yeah, oh, this boy, is brilliant. I, I found this to be brilliant. My my chat's disabled. I was going to try to write something, but I can't write anything. Uh, anyway, uh, anyway, please send uh, the rating. You know, three to nine. You have to be a paid member, uh, and send your uh, three is god awful. Nine is incredible, but send a three to nine rating to Elsie by chat. If you no, don't send it by chat because for some reason my chat's not working. Okay. That's the problem. Don't send it by chat. Send it by email then. But do send it, please. Otherwise, you'll be bugging you. All right. Okay. Good, good job. I mean, that was makes you. That was brilliant. It was absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, just to, learned how little I do know. A, a last <laughs> note. This is the book. I'm just putting it up on my screen. This is the book. The art it's of fine di art digital printing. It's free, and and it, it's put out by Moab for less. And, you know, here's all the stuff I kind of covered. You know, and it's talking about everything. It even tells you how to make some adjustments to uh, uh, some things. And can and you just download it directly from the Moab site? Well, when I send you that link, and I'll try to send it out tonight, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it sends you straight to where you can download the book. Okay. And see, this okay. is all the, the stuff. And this is talking about uh, uh, everything, uh, how to color to and here's soft proofing that uh you know it tells you about how to soft proof things you see the lady's lips here mm -hmm. big you, you see uh, uh yeah 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 you, you see in this image what it's showing you there is colors and in, uh, in the red lips that will that the monitor that that can be printed that the monitor can't right. show show the true color this exactly. is what, where it is here. The monitor can't show the true color here, but you can print that. And that's what soft proofing does. And, and this is the other one. So it, it, it goes into, there you go. Who asked the question about pixel size? There are 6,000 6, pixels across. And if you print, have an image 6,000 pixels across, you can, it'll print up to 13 inches. There you go. Go to bedtime with that one. Moab is in Utah. Yep. I guess so. I assume that's where they're located. Uh, that's it's on there uh, on on the uh, thing. So I'll I'll send that out to everybody, and I'll probably try to do that before I go to bed tonight.